Hello and welcome to this podcast about multi-factor verification on mobile devices. Today I'm talking to Alan Good from Good Intelligence, who's recently authored a white paper on this very subject. Alan, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Before we get down to the main discussion, could you give us some brief background regarding the white paper? Thank you, Steve. The white paper entitled The Case for Mobile Multi-Factor Verification was recently published by us and explores mobile-based authentication and identity verification. We investigated whether in these times where smart mobile devices have become the first screen for our daily work and leisure lives, existing authentication and identity verification solutions that rely on either short pins or cumbersome passwords are adequate. What are the alternatives that are agile, convenient, easy to use and secure? Okay, let's start by looking at the current situation. What do you think of the typical authentication provision on existing mobile devices? From what I can see, it doesn't seem to have advanced anywhere near as much as other aspects of the mobile device technology that we're now using. If we're talking about what comes shipped out of the box in typical smart devices, we have a combination of pins, passwords, and with some Android devices, pattern locks. If used, and there are many devices out there with no protection configured, these solutions are probably adequate in deterring unauthorized access by unskilled attackers, a street thief for instance. They are not adequate against a determined attack by someone with specific security knowledge. They are also not particularly intelligent in that they usually only lock and unlock the whole device and not specific apps or more sensitive data. All right, so getting us to the heart of what we're talking about today, what is mobile multi-factor verification? Mobile-based multi-factor verification or authentication requires a user to provide more than one form of ident- identifying factor for identity verification and authentication purposes using a mobile device as the tool or authenticator. Factors can include biometrics, fingerprint, voice, eye, face, etc., geolocation using GPS and mobile network positioning, behavior, how we hold and use our touchscreen devices, one time passwords, and even visual factors including recognizing image patterns. Mobile MFV can be used for authenticating for both PC and mobile-based services. You mentioned a variety of different factors here, but do all of them offer equal strength and reliability? I guess in some cases, a couple of badly selected factors might actually end up offering less protection than one well-chosen one. A good point, and I agree in that user choice must be factored alongside factor strength and policy. Policy may not necessarily be something that an organisation enterprise sets, Policy settings also have a vital job to play in protecting our own personal digital assets, our privacy if you like. For instance, we may feel that particular images stored on a device may need an extra level of protection than that offered by the standard phone lock solution. The owner of the images could assign a personal privacy policy for them that requires use of additional factors. Okay, so why is multi-factor verification needed in a mobile context? What problems is it actually seeking to address? Mobile-based MFV is needed to provide cost-effective, strong, agile authentication to secure both the PC and mobile channels. Traditional single-factor authentication solutions such as password and pins are insecure. And in an age where we have multiple accounts for a wide variety of consumer identified services, they are difficult to manage. You know, remembering multiple strong password and pins and there's a risk of having to write them down on paper or to store them in an unprotected digital files, often on a smartphone. Even popular two-factor authentication solutions such as OTP tokens or smart cards have been proven to be vulnerable to attack. For instance, the RSA hack and various man-in-the-middle or replay attacks. They're also not appropriate to protect the mobile channel as they can spoil the mobile experience. How difficult is it to to use a 2FA hardware token to authenticate the service from a mobile device when the user is mobile? Do you really want to take a 2FA token out of your pocket and enter in the OTP into a login challenge on the train or at an airport lounge? If designed and deployed correctly, then mobile MFV can overcome some of these issues and provide a convenient way to strongly authenticate users in a wide variety of use cases. So, okay, we're talking about multi-factor verification. Let's think about what are the driving factors behind the adoption of that sort of technology. I believe that the main drivers for MFV include vulnerabilities in existing authentication solutions, including weak passwords and the need to deploy cost-effective, scalable authentication and identity verification solution solutions to thousands and millions of users. Secondly, smart mobile devices, which include smartphones and tablets, 
with inbuilt sensors including accelerometers, microphone, forward and rear facing camera, GPS, that can be leveraged by MFD solutions without any adaption of the, de of the device. In future, this will include fingerprint sensors. Thirdly, the move to mobile and the consumerization of IT. There is a pressing need for solutions specifically designed for mobile devices and mobile users. This needs to also support devices that are not owned by an organization employee, for instance in a BYOD instance, but are running or accessing an organization's services and information. I particularly like the second point you make there about leveraging the existing capabilities of the devices for authentication purposes. This actually reflects the sort of approach we've been taking with much of our work in this area at Plymouth University. For example, we've had a long-term interest in the potential of keystroke dynamics on both normal PCs and on mobile handsets. And the main advantage that we see is it's a measure that can be obtained in a non-intrusive manner from the user perspective. So the idea is that they're able to do whatever they'd normally be doing in terms of keyboard or keypad activity and then be authenticated transparently as a byproduct of doing this. However, I'm not so sure about the fingerprint sensor aspect because at present at least this would seem to require a dedicated addition to the handset which wouldn't be serving any purpose other than specifically for security. What would be good, I guess, is if it could be achieved via the touchscreen. Do you think manufacturers would see the value in giving space to a dedicated sensor? given the increasing miniaturization of the devices and the fact that they need space for packing in other features. Does security rank highly enough in the priority list for this? If you asked me the same question about 12 months ago, I would have said no. But now, I feel that the industry has moved on and that security has moved up the priority list for device manufacturers. A combination of emerging mobile commerce services, including payments and the BYOD trend, means mobile phones are being used for functions where a greater level of security is required. And Apple's acquisition of fingerprint sensor manufacturer Authentic has generated a lot of media interest, with speculation that we may see Apple Eye devices with embedded fingerprint sensors within the next two years. So returning to the idea of mobile multi-factor verification in more general terms, do you think it's something that users themselves actually want? Yes, uh, we feel that there is a demand for both enterprise and consumer users for mobile-based MFV solutions, even though the technology is at an early stage of its development. The question remains whether individual users will choose to protect their mobile devices, including sensitive apps and information, by adopting mobile MFV, or will it be driven by the owner of the apps, for instance, the banks, the governments and cloud-based service providers? Yes, I'm sure the latter has some potential to happen, and we've seen banks taking the initiative and in requiring users to have a certain level of protection for their online banking services in general, so it would be reasonable to expect that they'd also insist on a particular provision for related mobile apps. So let's think about this a little further. How do you think MFV will work and look in terms of possible use cases? There are many potential use cases for mobile MFV, including these two the first in financial services, and the second to enhance security for cloud-based content or file storage and sharing. The first one in financial services. Um, an example could be identity verification for credit card referral. This is replacing an existing process whereby a customer services representative will contact a bank customer when potentially suspicious activity has been noticed on their credit card account. With mobile MFE being used, the scenario could look something like this. In real time at the point of sale, a credit card issuing bank is notified of the potentially fraudulent use of one of its customer's credit card transactions, a transaction initiated in a European country by a US resident, for instance. At the point of sale, a secure message is sent to a mobile banking app installed on the customer's mobile device, querying the credit card transaction and requesting the bank customer to, to verify the authenticity of that transaction then the bank customer is in fact on holiday in Europe and can vouch for the authenticity of that transaction. The bank application supports mobile-based MFE, and this will request the user to verify their identity and to approve the credit card transaction. And then the verified customer pays for their goods. Yes, now I guess some aspects of that scenario are possible now in terms of alerting the user to the transaction in progress and asking for their approval. But at present, it tends to involve them getting phoned up or having to phone the card company themselves to confirm the legitimacy. It would clearly be a lot easier from the customer perspective to be able to do that without that inconvenience. So how about the cloud storage use case that you also mentioned? In the second instance for digital content sharing in the cloud, digital content can mean a variety of digitized information, 
from pictures and videos to presentations and word processing documents. With flexible file sharing devices such as Dropbox and SharePoint, our digital content is being shared in a variety of ways with an increasing number of people. The big question is how we secure that digital content and ensure that only authorised individuals can access it. This is more of a user-centric model where the owner of the digital content assigns access rights through a, ver through a verification level. You can have one verif verification level for private folders and another for work-related documents. By setting a different file sharing level on each folder, two separate actions to assign verification levels are required on the mobile-based MFE solution. Mobile MFE is one option to support this more open, cloud-based digital content sharing. I guess another advantage of having multiple authentication factors is it allows for a degree of adaptability in the approach. What I mean here is that you've got different options available depending on where the user is and what they're doing. This is again something we've been looking at as part of our research in Plymouth, linking aspects such as the perceived sensitivity of the task or data involved in order to help inform the choice of authentication mechanism. So assuming we're thinking along similar lines here, how do you see the role of workflow and context in MFV? Workflow can enhance mobile multi-factor verification in adapting to different conditions or altering its state based on context decisions. For instance, a mobile MFE solution supports the following factors, voice, facial recognition, a soft token to, to, to generate an OTP on device, and telephony voice out-of-bound authentication solutions, or Uber. A person is waiting, for instance, a person is waiting for a connecting business flight at a busy airport terminal. The individual's company has a bring your own device policy, which means that the employee is using their own phone for business purposes. The flight is an hour away from departing and have some time to spare. As with most people in the 21st century, the first thing they do with a bit of time on their hands is to reach in their pocket and take out the mobile device. In this case, the person is an early adopter and is well aware of some of the security issues in using mobile phones for work and personal use. They are using a mobile MFE solution that allows the user to wrap multi-factor verification around the most important apps on that device. If an app that is protected by this MFE solution is, is accessed, the user is challenged to verify their identity. This is where workflow and context solutions start to become important, probably vital. The person is in a crowded, noisy environment and with the sun beaming down brightly onto the screen of the mobile device, there are challenges for single and dual factor authentication and identity verification solutions. The mobile device can now utilise its embedded sensors to access the current environment before choosing the most appropriate factor for identity verification. Opening up the microphone and taking an ambient noise reading informs the app that it's too noisy to use a voice print biometric. The embedded camera has a light sensor and is reading high levels of light that make a facial biometric problematic. The GPS sensor knows that the device is in an airport location, so potential shoulder surfing rules out entering in an OTP and motion detection is used to determine that the user is in transit. Ultimately, the environmental assessment results in choosing a telephone-based factor where the person receives a call thereby providing verbally the identity assurance required to gain access to the app in question. The discussion so far has been making reference to a number of different factors that could possibly be used. What factors do you think are most likely to get incorporated into MFV in practice? Do you see the user having any choice over the factors, or are they likely to be prescribed by the service providers? The latest smart mobile devices allow a variety of factors to be incorporated into a mobile MFV. The early years of mobile-based 2FA and MFE solutions were mainly about porting non-mobile authentication solutions to the mobile device with OTP, either generated on the device using a soft token app or generated by an authentication server and delivered to the device via SMS. Over the last 18 months, we've noticed a move towards incorporating other factors, ones that are adapting some of the characteristics of a modern mobile device. These include the GPS sensor for location, the microphone for voice recognition, the camera for facial and eye vein recognition. Iris is problematic due to the need to use a camera that supports infrared illumination. The accelerometer to determine the mobile's position and the touch screen to analyse touch and swipe input. The latter two can be used as factors in behavioural solutions. In answering the second question on user choice over the factors, I think in order for the user to set the factors themselves, it would require a degree of educating them to know that the relative strengths and weaknesses of each factor. 
I think in reality that this will be a hard ask for users that may not even be aware of what 2FA is. I think it would be more common that the factors and authentication and access control policy will be set, prescribed by the service providers. Would there perhaps be a place for the overall variety of mechanisms to be grouped into different security categories and then allowing the user to pick and choose their preferences within these levels? In one of our authentication architectures the, and the associated prototype, insofar as it had different sets of mechanisms grouped to say low, medium and high confidence, this was the approach in one of our authentication architectures and the associated prototype, insofar as it had different sets of mechanisms grouped at, say, low, medium and high confidence, and would select the most appropriate one based on what the user was doing and or the techniques that had proven the best for them in the past. I guess giving the user some choice over the process would avoid them being exposed to techniques they didn't like, and thus improving their likely tolerance of security overall. Would you agree with that perspective? Totally. To repeat what I said earlier on, user choice, context and appropriate security are something that we in the industry should strive for. It's very difficult to get it right, however. You don't want to over-elaborate the security mechanism or architecture or put too much onus on the user of that security model. Not everyone is a trained information security professional or academic. In terms of improving the user's likely tolerance of security, the user experience, especially on mobile, is key make it too complicated or cumbersome and end users will circumvent the security and try to find ways around it. Yes, I'd absolutely agree with that and certainly that's the sort of thing that we've been seeing in terms of some of our research on the usability of security more generally. Now just referring back to some of your earlier answers, you've made several references to biometric approaches being amongst the available techniques. Do you think these will be an important factor in MFV and if so, which ones do you think will offer the most potential? Yes, we thought that biometrics will, be, will become a core feature of MFV, perhaps initially not as the main factor for authentication and identification. For many users, especially consumers, it will be their first experience of using a biometric, so we expect some level of cultural adaptation to familiarise new users with this technology. We believe that fingerprint and voice will be the two biometric modalities that will have the highest adoption rates in the next two to three years. They are already on an estimated 18 million mobile devices that have an embedded fingerprint sensor on them. With the recent acquisition of fingerprint sensor vendor Authentic by Apple, we believe that fingerprint sensors on mobile will go mainstream within the next two years, maybe as early as 2013 next year. Voice is already supported in all mobile devices and there are a number of innovative technology companies including Nuance and VoiceVault who have robust solutions designed for mobile devices. OK, last question. Over what time frame do you see MFV becoming a reality for mainstream mobile users? A lot of the features that we've discussed here are at the early stages of being released onto the market. At Good Intelligence, we are working with a number of innovative technology companies around the world, advising them on MFV products and solutions. Some of these are already being commercialised with pilot users testing out the solutions in the real world, whilst others will be launched within the next 6 to 12 months. In terms of mainstream use, I think perhaps we're about two to four years away. Well, it'll certainly be interesting to see how things develop over these time frames and the benefits that they'll hopefully bring to the security of the devices and the protection of the users as a result. And with that, I think it's time to draw us to a close. Alan, it's been great to talk to you and thanks for a really interesting conversation. It's been a pleasure, Steve. Thank you for the opportunity.